Revelation chapter 2. Good to have everybody here with us today. Good to have Brother Sterling here, Sister Gloria. You doing all right today? Fair. Fair to Midland. I won't make you preach nothing today. How's that? Clear to partly cloudy. Um, I asked you earlier to pray for me, and uh, there's a little thing. I'll, I'll announce it later on during the service, but uh, we found out that uh, one of my granddaughters, Gracelyn, can I say this? Okay. Um, we're not for sure yet, but they're checking her out for cerebral palsy. And um, it's got me whacked. Um, so she's such a cutie. And, and I mean every time I look at her, she got the biggest, silliest Mike Hoggard grin. And uh, so if my mind seems off today, that's where it is, all right? So Thyatira, Revelation chapter 2. We started this last Sunday. Uh, verse 18, did you bring a Bible today? Is it a King James? Hope it is. Under the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. He said, I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works. And then he said, the last to be more than the first. I don't know, if, did anybody give that any thought? Why did you, and I've wondered this, and I even took a course on the book of Revelation in, in Bible college. And made a D minus on it. Imagine that. But why do you think he said the first to be more or the last to be more than the first? He said, I know thy works. And then charity, service, faith, patience. And, I, and thy works. So he repeated it twice. And then he said the last to be more than the first. Why do you think he said why do you think he said it that way, Gary? Well, I think, you know, in the gospel it talks about the uh, children being first. Yeah. And, you know, the last should be first. The servant, the servant will be, be, be before the... Mm -hmm. That's what I think. Gary's our church, our, our Sunday school church seminarian. Chris is another one of our seminarians. last being more than the first here's what I see and, and, and I'm going to tie this in with Jezebel because that's who we're talking about the gospel is supposed to be about grace through faith and that not of ourselves it is a gift of God not of works lest any man should boast for we are his workmanship created uh, something unto good works in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, the work that is done or that we do is not us doing it. It is done through us. But because they have Jezebel here, Jezebel and her gospel is always going to be a gospel of works. There was, and my mom and my sister know who started this church. There, there was a church, and I don't think it's still going anymore. But there was a church that started up, and I knew the pastor. 
and they made, they made the newspaper, this local Jefferson County newspaper, because they put up a thing that said, stop going to church. Start being the church. And what they did was for like a whole month or maybe a couple weeks, something like that, they didn't have church on Sunday. They went out and picked up trash somewhere and then they painted like a wall at the, at the city park and they got, all, they got their picture in the paper with you know the, the headlines and the name of their church and all the works that they did. And I've been seeing this, especially when you hear of churches brag about how many baptisms they have. Well, we had so and so and so and so many baptisms. Who cares? How many people were saved? Because you can be baptized and you can t talk people into getting baptized and them not being saved. There was a church... And a lot of people I know down in Arkansas know the pastor of this church. It's a Southern Baptist church and one of these that turned itself into a mega church. And they built a big whole new building just for the children's church department. And when they had a baptism, a child baptism, then they would have a confetti cannon go off and big sirens going off. And, and in other words, they made a big flashy deal out of it. Well, if you're a kid, don't you want to go get baptized so you can have that done? When, and that's what I'm thinking. And I know that's what they're thinking. So they can brag about how many baptisms they had. And, and that's how I found out about it. They were bragging about the number of children they were baptizing. Well, all they were doing was telling these kids, if you come get in the water, we'll make a big flashy show out of it and everybody will be looking at you. But that's not salvation. Now that particular church might say, well, they got saved and they're eternally secure. Therefore, once they got baptized and we shot the confetti cannon and we did all the other things, they're secure for life. And that's not salvation. So I think he says here, the last to be more than the first. Now they're all about what they're doing because Jezebel's here. Because he's verse 20, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess. We started on that last Sunday. She's self-appointed. She called herself, no one laid hands on her, no one approved her, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication. So guess what she was doing with the people in that church? With the, well, guess what she was doing with the guys in that church? Okay? And to eat things sacrificed to idols. So last week we started looking at who Jezebel was. She's the daughter of Ethbaal. Her name has Bell in it. And I told you that anytime you would see in the Old Testament, Bell or Baal in a name like sons of Belial, Bell Isle is Baal. It's Baal. It's the Antichrist, it's Satan and so on. That's where she came from. We know that First Kings 18, she cut off the prophets of the Lord, which means the Bible. She cut, listen to this now, she cut off your Bible reading. You're, I'm talking to the, my Sunday school class and my Sunday school class online. She is the one who cut off your Bible reading. Whatever, however she does it, she doesn't care whether it's the shows you wanted to watch on TV. Or nowadays, you know how in the old days we had to wait for a TV show to come on. And then once we watched it, we knew we weren't going to see that same TV show again until 
summertime when they did all the reruns. Well, nowadays we can binge watch. We can pull up on Netflix or Hulu or Voodoo or whatever. We can pull up and watch a whole series of the same TV show, one right after another. And she's cutting off people's Bible reading. Or whatever else she can occupy your mind with, that's how she does it. It even works on me here when I'm in the ministry working here. She can get me so busy or get my mind so distracted, I'll go, I haven't read my Bible yet. So sometimes if you, some of you folks call, especially in the morning, can I talk to Pastor Mike? And they call up, and if I say I'm studying, that's my Bible reading time. I'm learning to tell God yes and have to tell some people no, I can't talk right now. Have them call back in the afternoon or whatever, then I'll spend time with them. But I am making, I'm not a guy... I'm not a guy who is organized, and my mom. Just look at every desk I have. But I'm making myself, you can exercise yourself unto godliness, can you not? You can, as, as you built bad habits in life, you can build good habits. So build good habits in life with Bible reading. She uh, has the groves of 400 uh, in 1 Kings 18. She had the prophets of the groves, 400, which ate at Jezebel's table. She takes good care of her preacher boys, her prophets. She pays them well. She gives them good pay packages. And they're not going to... Those preachers, now, those preachers are not going to risk... and. I have a, I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell it again. And it's a sad story because I really like this preacher. He actually gave me my very first speaking engagement dealing with the King James Bible. And it was, Mom, it was Mamaw's pastor. Okay? As, and he called me. Want to know, he said... I, he said he was trying to get the King James in this church. It was a Southern Baptist church. They had bought a bunch of pew Bibles and they were all NIVs. And so he asked me to come. And would I spend about three days teaching them? So yeah, I'll tell them what I know. So I spent three days down there and we had some pretty good services, I thought. So then after that, on Sunday night, the preacher followed that up by preaching on some things on the King James, related to the King James. After about three months of that, his people had had enough of it. And out of a church of, you've been to that church, Mom, what they have, maybe 100 people, 110 people, something like that. Out of a church of 110 people, they, had, they pulled out 17 deacons. I think they dug some of them up out of the cemetery, brought them over. 17 deacons in this church and on a Sunday afternoon they had a deacons meeting without the pastor the pastor knew that there was a meeting going on so he's hanging around the church that afternoon Sunday afternoon and they had their meeting and they finally called him in and they said bottom line is we're sick and tired of this King James only stuff we're not buying new pew Bibles. So either you stop what you're preaching on that or find yourself another church. And he stopped and stayed there. And I, I'm, listen, I prayed for the guy. I actually saw him not too long after that at a Southwest Radio church conference Noah Hutchings them I actually he came to that conference I think it was in Little Rock and he came and prayed with him he told me about he finally left that church and went to another one and I said good I'm glad you got out of there because he told me what had happened I heard this from him it's not gossip 
And I always felt horrible for him because they were, he didn't have any other income. It was just him and his wife. They were older. His kids had grown up and married off. I don't know what they paid him, but they were holding his paycheck, paycheck in front of him saying, you either do what we tell you to do or you can get out. And it scared him. Jezebel will take care of good, good care of her preachers so that when it's time to preach something that's actually right, they won't do it because that might rock the boat in the church. That happens. That happens more. I know of another preacher took a church. He took that church and all of a sudden it started growing. That church hadn't grown in years. People were getting saved. He was preaching against sin. That hadn't happened in years. There was a guy in that church who had family members on. It was one of these committee churches. They had committees for everything. He wasn't on a committee, but he had people on committees in, from his family. It was on all the committees in the church. He was a pharmacist, but he owned about 10 pharmacies in that area, big area. So he made a lot of money. And the preacher found out he was laundering money through the church. And when he approached him with it, the guy told him, they was having lunch, a guy told him, he said, I thought you were smarter than this. He said, what are you talking about? He said, why don't you just mind your own business? And what that guy was doing, that guy was paying that preacher's, there was a Christian school in the area. He was paying for his four kids to go to that Christian school. So he was trying to lock his claws into him. Jezebel can be a guy sometimes. And they finally had a big, big vote of confidence meeting on a Saturday. And some of the people stood up for the pastor and they said, if he's going, we're going. We ain't staying. We've had, we've had enough of that stuff going on in this church for years. Well, finally, the, the pastor just said, I'm stepping down. I'm not going to, I'm not going to stay here. And he left. That kind of stuff goes on everywhere. Jezebel ties men up with money and power and uses that power over them or things that she knows about them. She will use that against them to get those preachers or those churches to do what she wants them to do. And it happens to, on the denomination level. It happens on the church level. It happens on the big ministry level. It happens. Let me move on. First Kings, we already talked about, um, let's see here. Yeah, First Kings 19, turn there. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. This is the showdown that Elijah had with the prophets of Baal and how they said, you know, whoever, whoever sends fire down from heaven is the real and true God. You remember that? And God, God prevailed in that. So Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Apparently, Eli uh, Ahab, uh, Jezebel didn't know what was going on. And, with thought, and then once, once Elijah won and God won, he took Jezebel's prophets and had them all killed. And with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword, then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, let the gods do to me and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. She threatened to kill Elijah, the man of God. I'll kill him by this time tomorrow. I'll kill him. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah and left his servant there. Now, I've been... I don't know that I've ever been physically threatened. But I, having had to deal with Jezebel before, whether it was in my own life 
or in this church over the years that I've been here, I can say that yes, you can get victory, but you run off licking your wounds saying it is enough. Now, Lord, please take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. In other words, God, just kill me now and get it over with. Like I say, you can win against her. You can have the victory. But when you're done, you wish you had never been born. That's how she makes you feel. She's, I mean, she is a mean, wicked, and Jesus is saying, you've got this woman in your church. And everything, and I believe that everything that Jezebel, that we're pointing out here about Jezebel, is her. And let's say the church at Thyatira, we don't know this. Let's say the church at Thyatira finally run her out. I guarantee you they lost half their church. Guarantee you. Most of the people left with her or they were so wounded and damaged because of what happened, they just all fell out. So here's a pastor left now with maybe a third or a fourth of the church that he used to have before. My heart has been for this uh, Hope Free Will Baptist Church in Ada, Oklahoma, where the pastor, his, his wife had his head blown off, pastor got caught in this lifestyle with his wife and another guy, and it ended up in murder. His wife now, she's, she's, on, she's in jail for murder. The guy's in jail for murder. The pastor's found out what kind of person he really was. Jezebel did all that, didn't she? See, she taught, Jezebel taught this pastor to commit fornication and that he could get away with it. I'm telling you, your sin will always find you out, won't it? Always. And so now this church Hope Church has got no hope. Maybe God can send revival now in that church. Maybe he can. But since that whole town knows about that church, in fact, that whole county, the whole state of Oklahoma knows about that church, who are they going to get to go there? Who would go there? Because what's to say that that fornication had been running through the whole church? There's a church in this town that had a Jezebel going to it, and I knew her from back in my school days. She was sleeping with several men in the church, and one of the men she was sleeping with she talked into killing her husband and making it look like a deer hunting accident. And in the course of the investigation, of course, they're finding all these names of guys and people in the church that she had been with. I'm telling you, people, Jezebel's bad. And she'll take some of the best people that you know what was it that Solomon said about the strange woman? Many strong men have been taken down by her. I'm paraphrasing. Many strong men have been destroyed by her. Many strong churches have been destroyed. Many strong pastors, preachers. I could stand here this morning and tell you story after story after story of how Jezebel has destroyed 
families, churches, denominations, ministries. She just destroys. That's all she does. Uh, 1 Kings 21. We'll go on this till the bell rings. There's a lot here. This is the story of uh, Naboth and his vineyard. Uh, for, let's read it. And it came to pass after those things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard. The vineyard is, of course, Christ said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. A family is a vineyard. vineyard. Vineyard looks like DNA. Okay, so family, family bond, families can be destroyed. Churches can be destroyed. Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab the king of Samaria. And Ahab spake unto, Jeze unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I will give it the... I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it. And the, the question I'm asking is, if Ahab actually does have a better vineyard, why is he wanting to give his way to get Naboth? That doesn't make sense to me. So that sounds like a lie, right? It sounds like a lie. I will give it thee for it a better vineyard than it, or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. The love of money is the root of all evil. It's not just pastors that can chase after money in a church. Like I said, this guy in this church, that this, this pastor friend of mine, he ruled that church from behind. Jezebel's always behind us. And she's in the shadows. And this guy never sat on a committee in that church, but he had people positioned. So that he could, he could launder money through that church and get away with it. And I won't tell you the whole deal about it, but he was doing it. And the pastor I know called David Gibbs, the Christian Law Association, called, I um, uh, can't remember another guy, it was a big Christian law thing. He called both of them. And they both told him, now that you know about it, you better put a stop to it now or you're going to prison. Because if you know about it and you don't do anything to stop it, you're a co-conspirator and you're going to prison. And this guy's like, I'm not going to prison. So, I mean, he brought it up and he said, you're laundering money through the church. You're doing it on purpose and it's got to stop. And boy, I mean, it broke loose. I will give thee the worth of it money. I know the bell rang. Nabal said today, have the Lord forbid it me that I should get, uh, give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. Listen, you hold on to your family. Don't let the world have your family. Let's us hold on to this church. We got a family here. I, I don't know them. They, as soon as they saw me, Brother Mike, how you doing? Mike Hargett, how you doing? Okay, they're here. They didn't drive all the way out from Pennsylvania to just come to some random church in Missouri because they think church, Missouri churches are all better than the ones in Pennsylvania. They came here because of that. And we've got to hang on to that. Now, if God takes it away, God takes it away. That's him. That's up to him. But I'd rather it be God take it away than me do something stupid. And ruin it. I don't want to be the guy laying in bed with my wife's boyfriend having my gun shooting me in the middle of the night. Sweetie would, sweetie pie would never do that to me. But you get what I'm saying. This church and my family is the most precious thing to me other than my salvation. I don't want anything else this world has to offer. I don't want another woman. I don't want another church. I've been offered jobs. I don't want them. 
I've got what I want right here. This is my vineyard. And Ahab and Jezebel can't have it, and I'll die for it. So you think about that. Guys, ladies, kids. JR is going to be 18 in a few days. JR, God's fixing to give you a vineyard. And when he does, you hang on to it because it's the most important, precious thing you'll ever have, ever. Amen. Father, bless your word. I hate Jezebel. I hate her. I hate everything she does. I hate the damage she causes. Jesus, you knew, Jez you knew who it was in this church. And you wanted that church to put her out. Knowing, Father, what it would cost. But Father, what it would cost is nowhere near what they would lose if they let her continue on. She has to be stopped. Father, help us. God, give us the strength. Please, God, whatever form she takes in our lives, please, God, give us the strength to put her out, stand against her. Thank you, Lord, for this word, God. Bless it, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.